Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Bryant. I have the good fortune to be your library director. And we see that some of our regulars are probably out on 111, heading for the 10, and heading back to Minnesota, and maybe some are going to British Columbia. But <clears throat> you're, you look like a rapt audience, all ready to go, and we're pleased that you're with us today. We are um, really lucky to have with us today a lecturer of great uh, experience and intelligence. Edward E. Gordon is uh, very impressive, and this is the first lecture that he will be giving in this library, but there will be many more in the future. But before we get underway, I want to thank Roberta Jones. Roberta, would you raise your hand and wave a little? This lecture, as well as the programs that we brought you in January with Bill Gudalunas, who spoke about the, uh, the wonderful era of the 50s and 60s in the United States, were funded by Roberta Jones. Please thank her for that. <laughs> that interest that Roberta has in American history is serving this library very, very well, so we appreciate it. And I would remind you, if you have a cell phone, and frankly, how many of you don't, which would probably be none of you, uh, please turn it off at this time. Just a friendly reminder. Item two, you'll see the microphone up here in the front. And though perhaps a bit of a nuisance, if you have a question, and Dr. Gordon will certainly be doing a robust Q&A with all of you and welcoming that, come on up and ask your question. We do that for a couple of reasons. The obvious one is so everybody can hear your question. And if it's a good question, we want that. If it's not a good question, well, we'll suffer through it. But we also want to record it, and we videotape each of these events, and we later show them on Rancher Mirage TV, which is channel 17 if you live in our zip code. So just a bit of uh, housekeeping there. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce to you um, Edward E. Gordon, whose resume is impressive to say the least. He taught history at DePaul University in Chicago. He has presented historical programs across America to community groups and trade associations, as well as colleges, universities, and museums, including, for the past 11 years, the uh, Palm Springs Air Museum. Ed Gordon is the author of 18 books and over 300 articles in the area of history, business, and education. He has appeared on the CBS Network's The Early Show. He's appeared on CNN, the PBS NewsHour. You've heard him on National Public Radio, and he's been on many other media venues. Dr. Gordon earned his BA and MA degrees in history from DePaul University in Chicago and his PhD at Loyola University in Chicago. He and his wife reside in both Chicago and Palm Desert. And before Ed takes the uh, microphone, I'm going to give him my Rancho Mirage pin as a welcome. So please welcome Dr. Gordon. Thank you, David. This is uh, his way of ensuring I do a good job. <laughs> Soldiers, sailors, and airmen, of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and dreams of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. These were the words of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Force on June the 6th, 1944. This is the story of D-Day at 70 years and the new perspectives that we have gained on this topic over the, particularly the past 20 to 30 years. So first, let's set the stage. For five and a half years, France had been occupied by the Germans. Here they are marching into Paris in June of 1940. From May of June of 40 to June of 1944, the Germans ruled and occupied Europe. A barbarous criminal regime responsible for the deaths of millions of innocent people. Jews, non-Jews, Catholics, 
labor leaders, anyone who imposed them. At least 12 million people were destroyed by the Nazis in non-combat situations. To attack this fortress, the Allies knew that they were going to have to seize a port. Now, they had conducted raids up and down the coast of Europe, starting in 1940, because Churchill, even though the British were too weak all by themselves to attack, he wanted to have these pinprick raids to set terror into the hearts of the Germans throughout Europe. So they decided they would try, in August of 1942, a practice raid on Dieppe. Oops. back one, here we are. And here is Dieppe. Now why a port? Because to land hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of men, you had to have logistics, gasoline, food, and other supplies. So the Germans figured that they had to have a port. So they attempted to take that port to support an invasion and see if it would work. The Canadians, were largely the troops used. There was no preliminary naval bombardment in order to assure surprise, no preliminary air bombing, and no ground air support. The result, as you can see from this slide, was an unmitigated disaster. Many Canadians were killed, wounded, and captured. And the Germans felt very comfortable of mainly concentrating most of their efforts on the ports of Europe. Fortress Europe, Festung Europa, 2,400 miles of coastline, stretching from Denmark to Spain. 15,000 permanent strong points. For two years, 250,000 men, 90% were foreign slave labor, used 1 million tons of steel and poured more than 20 million yards of concrete. From Schorberg to, to Calais, which was the primary place they thought the invasion would occur, Calais being the narrowest part of the channel, and Schorberg being where the Normandy Peninsula is, was called the Zone of Death, because, and it was featured and known to be the primary invasion sites. In this Zone of Death, the Germans put 500,000 anti-invasion obstacles, such as these steel web traps you see, anti-tank barriers, hedgehogs, twisted steel to rip open landing craft at high tide, because the Germans felt they'd land at high tide so that the Allied soldiers would have a shorter beach to go across. Four million mines were planted in depth. Tens of thousands of individual defense works were built. Heavy coastal guns, artillery and machine gun pillboxes, ammunition bunkers, observation towers, communication centers, radar facilities, medical facilities. Here I stand next to a Sotka 150 millimeter destroyer gun that would have been found on many destroyers. We had a range of 19 kilometers, and this is located between Omaha and Gold Beach. I want you to notice how intact this gun is. Reason, two meter thick walls and roof of cement. Of cement. The Germans sank several of our destroyers using a battery of three guns. Some of you are just going to go to Normandy. Make sure you see this. This is between Omaha Beach and uh, Gold, Juno, and Sword beaches, you, and, you, and it's easily accessible. Just to show you how strong these emplacements were, this, in 2005, are three German bunkers that were recently discovered intact on the coast of Denmark. They had been buried for 60 years in sand dunes from violent storms, and as you can see, they have survived. Behind Fortress Europa stood this German army, 60 German divisions, seven panzer armored divisions of 1,600 tanks. But the Germans, as, and as we will see shortly, the Allies, had a very Byzantine command structure. 
At the top was the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, the supreme warlord and military commander. The British, in 1943, had an active operation to assassinate Adolf Hitler, had a marksman infiltrate Birch's garden, and called it off because they figured Hitler by that point was doing more damage to the German war effort than if they killed him. And the army would have been taken over then by the German generals who might have turned things around. Hitler, by this point, was micromanaging the war. And he was in charge of moving every division, even every regiment, on um, all the fronts. This was the German command structure with General von Rundstedt in command and featuring prominently the Desert Fox himself, Erwin Rommel. Here's a better picture of the two of them together. Rundstedt, CNC West, Rommel, commander of Army Group B. Of course, to make things even more confusing, France was divided into two army groups, Army Group B in the north, and in the south, Army Group, uh, what, is I, what do I have there, G which was mainly to, for the second invasion, they feared in the south of France. There were two competing views by the Germans on how to fight this invasion. Rommel's view was to stop it at the beaches because he felt that the Allies had such material superiority. The German Tiger tanks may have been the best tanks in the world, but for every one that they built, the Allies built a thousand Sherman tanks. So no matter how many Shermans they destroyed, there were overwhelming amounts of Allied materiel and air power. Rommel had experienced this in North Africa, and he felt that they had to stop the Allies at the beaches. And of course, his comment that it would be the longest day proved to be true. This was versus von Rundstedt a more classic military commander who had been involved in the first invasion in France and then had actually also participated in the invasion of the Ukraine in 1941 by the Germans. He felt that the armor should be held intact as a massive reserve, all the divisions together, and that they would launch a massive counterattack. Rommel knew that if that occurred, the Allied air power would destroy those tanks if they moved during the day and even at night. Remember, all these divisions had to have massive amounts of fuel and other materiel to support them. So that type of counterattack, by this point, the, uh, the Germans, as we will see, did, simply did not have the strength. Now on the Allied side, we see here a beautiful photograph of the Allied military command with General Eisenhower, the supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force called Schaefe. In the front row, starting here on the left, is, Gen is Air Marshal Tedder, the deputy commander for the invasion, British. In the middle, General Eisenhower. Next to him, General Montgomery, who would command all of the ground forces on D-Day, British general. Back row, General Omar Bradley, who would be the commander of the U.S. First Army. Next to him, Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, the naval commander-in-chief of all the ships on D-Day and afterwards. Next to him, Air Marshal Lee Mallory, who is the commander of the, uh, all the air forces for D-Day. And next to him, uh, General Beadle Smith, who was Eisenhower's chief of staff. Now, there's quite a bit of controversy that most people do not realize over this appointment. You see here a picture of Eisenhower with his boss, General George Marshall. Marshall wanted to command D-Day and uh, maybe would have, except President Roosevelt stopped the appointment because Marshall was, of course, conducting a war on both fronts, both in the Pacific, trying to balance off Nimitz versus General MacArthur the, and the Air Command, and then, of course, in Europe, the British, American, and French interests all competing with each other. And Roosevelt felt he could not be dispensed with. Also, there was General Allenbrook, who is the British Chief of Staff. It should be remembered that Montgomery worked for Allenbrook and was 
under him through for much of his professional military career. He was one of the few generals that he feared. Montgomery feared and also respected Allenbrook. And on several occasions, Allenbrook rebuked Montgomery and Montgomery acted. We'll talk about this later. And uh, he also, of course, would be the general commander of the ground forces for Normandy. And of course, the other person besides Montgomery for the uh, Allied ground forces was, of course, good old George Patton. Unfortunately, George had slapped a soldier in a hospital in Sicily, and that incident reduced him to nonanimity. Whether that should or should not have been done is a moot point, but the fact is the best fighting commander the United States had tactically in the Second World War was on the sidelines and was not in command of either the U.S. ground forces on Normandy, on D-Day, or afterwards, or the overall ground command. The person who had replaced him was his second in command, General Omar Bradley, a wonderful general, a GI general. But he had been subordinate to Patton, and uh, in all honesty, Bradley was not as aggressive as Patton was. In fact, Patton was probably the most aggressive of all U.S. commanders uh, on both sides of the Pacific or the Atlantic in this war. And then Sir Admiral Bertram Ramsey. Ramsey had been in charge of the massive D -Day, uh, Dunkirk evacuation in November. If that had not succeeded, Churchill possibly would have come to terms with Hitler because Montgomery and all the other British officers that were here would have been captured plus all of the first rank British troops would have been captured. The British would have had no army in 1940. He also had served as the naval planner for Torch, which was the landing in North Africa, and for Sicily. And he worked with Eisenhower in planning those invasions. Immediately after Sicily, he then became the commander in chief of the naval part of Normandy, Operation Neptune, and uh, as a result, ended up being Commander-in-Chief of all naval forces. Now, of course, there's always good old Winston, Winston S. Churchill, the war leader of Great Britain. Now, he, of course, was not part of the invasion. However, he loved to interfere, and Eisenhower had a very hard time keeping uh, him uh, keeping his hands off the invasion. But Eisenhower did a great job for what he was meant to do, which was to balance the alliance between American interests, French interests, and British interests. That was his primary role before the invasion. Well, they had to name the invasion. And in December and January of 44, the British had an inter-service bureau that came up with a code name. And they were having a meeting and Churchill said, well, what is the name we're going to have for this invasion? And they said, well, the only name we have available is Mothball. And people said, Mothball? Churchill said, I can't believe any soldier is going to tell his little grandchild, I was in the great invasion Mothball that took Western Europe. We have to come up with a better name. So he sat there for a moment and he said, I have it, Overlord. So it's Churchill who came up with the codename Overlord. So now let's take a look at the buildup for Overlord. 1.5 million U.S. troops were in the United Kingdom by May of 1944. Another million U.S. soldiers would follow by February of 45. There were already one and a three quarter million U.K. and Commonwealth troops with the Americans in England and uh, Wales and Scotland. 8,000 airplanes had been massed, 450 tons of ammunition, 50,000 vehicles of all types. Eisenhower once said, only the great barrage balloons floating over England kept it from sinking under all this weight. And now let us not minimize who really won the war. Rosie, about a hundred years ago, 
America first mandated public education for everyone between 1890 and 1920. Before that, we did not mandate public education or fund it properly. So in the 1920s, the first generation of American women went to high school. Some they had done before, but most had not. Because of that measure, when the war broke out, women, even married women, who at that point had been prohibited from working by their employers, were now sent back to work. Because of that, on the job training and technical training programs, the women could do the math, they could read the blueprints, they could build the planes and tanks and ships that were necessary. So the contribution of Rosie the Riveter, how many of you had a Rosie the Riveter in your family, a mother or a grandmother or someone else? Raise your hands. My mother, she was an office manager for General Motors, building tanks and trucks in Chicago. And then, of course, is the development of the key breakthrough that made Normandy possible. Before the invention of the landing craft that we use in Normandy called the Higgins boat, and here it is, the final variation that appeared on, at Normandy, they used river barges, which were very clumsy, or rowboats, or, or other types of boats. They needed a flat landing barge that could come right up to the beach. I highly recommend you go to the D-Day Museum in New Orleans, where the Higgins family first crafted these boats, starting with river barges and working their way up to that craft. Here now is a picture of the Air Command with General Spatz. Carl Spatz is right here. He was in command of the Air Force before Normandy. And they started Operation Point Blank in June of 1943 which an aim to destroy the German fighter aircraft in the air and German Messerschmitt factories. Against him was a brilliant German, the youngest general in the German army, General Alfred Gallan, who had been a fighter pilot, and he was the opponent. At that point, those of you, how many of you have been down at some point to the Palm Springs Air Museum? Raise your hands. How many of you have been on the B-17 Flying Fortress? Raise your hand, or you've seen it, okay. Well, the idea is you massed all those planes with the multiple guns, and they could fly unescorted into Germany and bomb. Unfortunately, by the fall of 1943, the losses of those aircraft were so great, but more importantly, of the crews, that they had to stop the bombing completely. They could not tolerate the loss rate. They could build the planes, but they couldn't train the crews fast enough. Something had to be done. Eisenhower became commander-in-chief in January of 44, and he want, was given command of all the Allied Air Forces to prepare for the invasion. Instead of them bombing cities, they were going to interdict German supply lines. And this is the plane the Mustang. This is the finest single engine fighter built in the Second World War. Without this plane, we would not have gained air superiority over Normandy and Europe when we did. This was a British engine inside of an American plane. It had to fight its way through the bureaucracy, but it was born a high performance plane that could beat anything the Germans had. The bombing started it was called Big Week. The Mustangs escorted the B-17s. 10,000 tons of bombs were dropped on rail yards, roads, and other important targets to prevent the Germans from being able to rapidly reinforce the coastal areas of France. This was equal to all of the bombing done by the 8th Air Force in the previous year. 2,500 fighter sorties, only 28 of our fighters were shot down. There were still 2,600 bomber crew casualties. This is a French rail yard before we bombed it. Here's a picture of it after we finished. So you get an idea of how effective. At the same time, we shot down huge, huge numbers of German planes. 
In January, 1,300 fighters. February, 2,100 fighters. March, 2,100 fighters. A total of 5,500 German aircraft were shot down. And most importantly, we killed many of those pilots. The planes the Germans could replace. The, the Germans built more fighter planes in 1944 than any other war, year of the war because they put their factories underground. But they couldn't, again, replace the pilots effectively. They had no place to train them because we were gaining air superiority over oral Europe. The result was that La Fafa was broken by June 6 of 1944, and only token air resistance occurred the day of the invasion. And now for deception. We had a gigantic deception campaign that we mustered in order to confuse the Germans as to where we would land. But first, we should talk about the gratitude we should give to the French people. Many times people say the only time the French resistance started was after D-Day. That is a lie. There were thousands of French people from the beginning who risked their lives to provide very important intelligence to the Allies for this invasion. This book, 10,000 Eyes, chronicles how the French people risked their lives, ordinary people, such as the people who were painting the offices of the Tout organization. These are the German builders who built all those fortifications. And while they were in the offices, they would notice the plans for all the bunkers, all the gun sites, and they would steal those plans, the duplicates, and replace them before they were missed. Also, other more interesting things, such as the fact that the Germans had to have their laundry washed. And they all, the French always made sure, the French laundries, that they would underbid any German or anyone else so that they would do the laundry of the German soldiers. Well, why was that? Did the French love the Germans, the Bosch? I don't think so. The reason why is, when you pick the laundry up, you had to deliver it. And if a German unit or division or regiment were moved, the French laundry knew the location of that unit. And all that information was given to the Allies. So the French did a tremendous job long before the Allies landed that increased, and particularly after Germany invaded Russia, because Germany had very deep divisions between the French Communist Party and the other political parties. And at first, because Russia was allied with Germany, unbelievably, and it attacked Poland, but after the invasion, the French Communists also worked with all the other French groups, including de Gaulle's Free French, to start harassing the Germans. So Operation Fortitude was the Allied deception plan. And here is George Patton with his first army, and he was named the commander. And it was placed near Dover, near where the Germans thought the Allies would land at Pas de Calais. And they constructed a huge mythical army. Here is some of the tanks on maneuvers. May I say that it was a very lightweight military force. And I can also say that the Allies allowed the German reconnaissance planes to fly over that part of England and take numerous pictures of all these planes and tanks and guns massing. 100 reports were made by the Abwehr. The Abwehr was German army intelligence, predicting where the invasion would be. One was correct. Luckily, they didn't follow that one report. Also, too, of course, the Allies had strict control over all of the mail and all of the personnel, all the Allied military forces, particularly as they got closer to D-Day, they sealed off all of those uh, encampments for D-Day. And then right before the invasion, a crossword puzzle appeared in an American Midwestern paper and the answers, some of the answers to the puzzle were Overlord, Gold, Juno, Sword, Utah, and Omaha, all in the same puzzle. And of course, the FBI investigated and they found out, unbelievably, it was just a coincidence. It had nothing to do with anyone of cracking uh, the invasion site. So now, where were the Allies going to land? Here, at Pas de Calais, or here along Normandy. 
Well, Pas de Calais is the closest. The problem with Pas de Calais is a very steep, high cliffed area. As you see, it's a very narrow passage here, and all there's at times very, very strong currents coming through here, and the beaches are very poor. Normandy has large amounts of beaches. It's further away, obviously, from uh, Paris and Germany, the German border, but it has many large, broad beaches, and it has Cherbourg and La Havre, important ports. The Germans, when they planned their invasion in 1940, planned to invade southern England, as you see from these arrows, with five invasion beaches. They massed 4,000 river barges to do it. They had them in place. Luckily, the Germans switched from pounding all of these airfields in the south to destroy fighter command to the bombing of London, and as a result, they did not gain air superiority, and the invasion was put off, and then Hitler invaded Russia, and that was the end of the story. When the Allies, however, first considered this, they initially planned to use only three beaches. But it was decided by Ramsey and uh, by Montgomery and others that it would be too narrow an invasion front. So they settled on five beaches. There was only a problem with that. They only had enough landing craft for three beaches. So it further postponed the invasion. The Americans wanted to invade at first in 1942. Instead, they went to North Africa. In 1943, they didn't have the landing craft nor the trained personnel. And finally, in June of 44, they did. Now, at the last minute, of course, there was another problem. It was called weather. A major storm came out of the North Atlantic that postponed the invasion by one day. Then, a brief high came up and gave an improvement to these beaches for June the 6th. Now, the Germans, of course, had very poor weather reporting. By that point, many of the submarines and other ships in the Atlantic that they had used in prior years had been sunk. They didn't have any weather stations. So they thought that this bad weather, almost like winter, would continue and the Germans canceled all of their air and naval patrols in the Channel. In fact, Erwin Rommel went back to Germany on June the 5th to see Hitler because he wanted to request panzer divisions to be moved closer behind the front. And also, by irony, his wife's birthday was on June the 6th. Now the invasion begins. Early in the AM on June 6th, Thousands and thousands of paratroops were transported over the beaches of Normandy. A thousand RAF bombers conducted all-night raids along the coast, and life-size dummy paratroopers were dropped in many areas to confuse the Germans. The 6th British Airborne and glider troops were landed. The 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne, 18,000 men the largest airborne invasion up to that time, and it was predicted that 50% of these men would be casualties. Here's Eisenhower at the very last minute talking to paratroopers, and here again are the landing zones. So the British here in this area to seize key bridges so that Montgomery and the Commonwealth forces would take con. This, these are, that's the objective. That's what they wanted to do. This, the dark red is what they achieved on Normandy. And here are the Americans on this end, in or, again, in order to seize these crossways and also to prevent the Germans from bringing in reinforcements. These areas were all flooded. The Germans flooded these areas behind these beaches, and you could only cross these crossways, and it was key then for the paratroops to secure them. Our story starts at saint mary Glise with Private John Steele. He landed in the square of, of saint mary Glise. He was blown off course. With him were 20 other paratroopers who were all immediately shot by the Germans. 
He landed here, though, on this bell tower. You've seen the movie The Longest Day. Red Buttons is snagged on the tower. And it's true. Today, you can go in this church. You can see the stained glass windows to the 82nd Airborne. And right across from the church is a very good airborne and glider museum. So you get an idea of how flimsy those gliders were that they used. In the meantime, the seaborne assault started. Here's Admiral Ramsey. His uh, son, David Ramsey, who lives here in Rancho Mirage, would be here today, except he's having surgery. Uh, and by the way, David and I are planning to write a book on Normandy for the 75th anniversary, which I'll talk a little bit more about toward the end of the program. Ramsey commanded the entire D-Day fleet, which was 5,000 ships, seven battleships, 23 cruisers, 250 warships of all types, to land 170,000 soldiers on the first day. And again, the five beaches with arrows, Omaha, the 1st, U.S. 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions, Utah, the U.S. 4th Infantry Division that made up the U.S. 1st Army, Gold, the U.K. 50th Infantry Division, Juno, the Canadian 3rd Infantry Division, and Sword, the U.K. 3rd Infantry Division that made up the British 2nd Army. Well, let's go now to each beach. On Utah Beach, the landings were wrong. They landed 2,000 yards away from their designated site, which is just as well because where they were going to land were two very powerful German batteries, and they would have had tremendous casualties if they had landed on that spot. Who was in command? Well, you had the 57-year-old Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, son of Teddy, Bull Moose Roosevelt. He was the Assistant Division Commander, the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, he had participated in North Africa, Sicily, and Corsica landings, and he landed with the first wave. The landing went very well. The, the beach was flat. There was not a lot of surf. 28 of 33 Sherman tanks, and these were special tanks that could go in water, floated ashore and supported the invasion. The Germans had a secret weapon on that beach called a Goliath. It had remote control, unmanned miniature tank. The idea was it was filled with 200 pounds of dynamite, and it would come under our tanks or positions and blow them up. Well, like many other German weapons, these were over-engineered, and the bombardment upset very delicate electronic circuitry. You know, in those days, they didn't have transistors yet. And these tanks went around in circles, so they didn't do too much to help the Germans. So, light opposition, uh, you moved inland, yes, that's me on Utah Beach, and you can eat lunch in the German bunker today if you care to when you tour. Now let's go on to Gold, Juno, and Sword Beaches, the Canadian 3rd, British 50th, and 3rd Infantry Divisions. This was a French seaside village area with very low beaches. The British landed to music blaring from barges and destroyers, roll out the barrel. Bagpipes played martial Highland airs. And with it, of course, any reasonable observer might have thought that this man, Bill Millen, was unarmed as he jumped off the landing ramp at Sword on June 6th. But Mr. Millen was not unarmed. Far from it, he held his pipes. And being a good Scotsman, I approve. High over his head to keep them from the water and the wet, the pipes a long tradition encountered as an instrument of war. The swirling whirl of the pipes had struck dread in the Germans in the First World War on the Somme. They had called the kilted Highlanders the ladies from hell. Three times, therefore, he walked up and down the edge of the beach. He remembered the sand shaking under his feet and the dead bodies rolling in the surf beneath him. He piped the advancing troops along raised roads over these crossways along the Khan Canal. He saw flashes of rifles from snipers about 100 yards. He noticed everyone else diving into the ground except him. He took them over two bridges. Quote, these were the longest bridges I ever piped across, unquote, Millen's admit. 
The last tune he piped on D-Day was the Nut Brown Maiden. He played it for a little red-headed French girl who, with her folks, was cowering behind her and asked him for music as he passed their farm. He gave the pipes later to a museum at the Pegasus Bridge, which he often revisited and piped across. Years later, though, on one of these visits, in full Highland rig, with his pipes in his arms, he was approached by a smartly dressed woman of a certain age, with faded red hair, who planted a joyous kiss of remembrance on his cheek, his final reward for a job well done. The British overwhelmed relatively light opposition, and they moved inland toward Khan. And then, of course, there's the role of Winston on D-Day. Well, Winston had informed Eisenhower that as the commander, in, as what he felt to be the commander-in-chief, at least politically, whereas the king was real, the commander-in-chief of the forces, he had to be in the first wave on D-Day with the British troops. Well, Eisenhower, of course, was absolutely petrified that he would be killed or severely wounded and he didn't know what to do. So he contacted the king, George VI, and told him the problem. So George wrote Churchill a very nice letter and said that he felt as the king and as the commander-in-chief of the royal armies, he should be in the first wave. And Churchill said that that was impossible and that he wouldn't let him go. And if he wouldn't go, Churchill wouldn't go and therefore no one went. This past summer, I had the opportunity to be in Cambridge and go to the Churchill Archives, and through my good friend David Ramsey, the chief archivist, had taken out some of the original manuscripts of Winston Churchill. And very carefully, he showed me those letters, which I took photographs of. I would show you them, but they're too illegible to be put up on a slide like this. I also did see something else of interest for you ladies, because Margaret Thatcher's papers are there, and they also have the chief weapon she used every time she sat in Parliament to defend her government, her purse. So I saw Margaret Thatcher's purse. Now the seaborne assault continued. Point to Hawk, three miles west of Omaha Beach, right, yeah. U.S. Rangers scaled these heights, 100-foot high precipices, to destroy a concentrated battery of six 155-millimeter howitzers. These huge casemates, guns at Point de Hoc, were a bluff. The gun barrels pointing out were telegraph poles, a ruse to war that Rommel had devised to distract. The Ranger assault was a huge mistake, at the end of the day, the Germans had three counterattacks. Only 90 of these 225 rangers who scaled the cliffs could still stand by the end of the day. However, meanwhile, nearby, at the Maisie Battery, which no one knew about, was well camouflaged and pounding the beaches until it was captured. This did not occur until the morning of June the 9th and then Half-Tracks and the U.S. 2nd and 5th Rangers captured this battery. Military enthusiast Gary Stern came across this site. It was buried, a 40-acre site, after studying a wartime map marked Area of High Resistance. The site overlooked by the Allies was of major importance. It was probably the largest combined German battery and headquarters complex outside of Schorberg and Le Havre, and it had not been seen since the war which makes it one of the most significant finds. Exactly how many casualties these two blunders cost the Allies will not be known. However, for those of you in the audience who are shortly to go there, the, this site opened for tourists in 2007, so make sure you go there. And now, Omaha Beach. Sheer cliffs, 100 feet high a beach 300 yards wide. The German 716th Infantry and the 352nd Infantry Divisions, 78 
75 and 88 millimeter guns, concrete, uh, protected by a concrete wall three feet thick. The 1st Infantry Division landed at 630. 29 of its floating tanks were immediately swamped and sank. 10 landing craft sank in heavy seas or were blown up before they even hit the beach. Everything went wrong that could go wrong. The German batteries had not been suppressed because when the Allies came to bomb, they delayed the bombing by 30 seconds and all the bombs fell inland. And the bombardment was ineffective by the ships. Soldiers were pinned down at the edge of the beach. Landmines were not cleared. To provide suppressing fire, destroyers finally came in so close to the beach that only a few inches separated their keels from the bottom. General Bradley, U.S. ground commander offshore, considered withdrawing the troops from that beach. If he had, the invasion would have failed because Utah would have been over here and the British beaches over there and there would have been no united beachhead and the invasion would have failed. They would have had to withdraw. However, by 11 a.m., through heroic acts of individual courage, they finally made the first breakthroughs. It shows the versatility, stamina, and inventiveness of American soldiers under fire and combat, for which we can be heartily proud and thankful. Everything went wrong. They would not allow the reporters who landed with the troops any radios to radio back stories back to England. So they gave them carrier pigeons, and they'd wrap their stories, and the carrier pigeons would fly off. But they flew the wrong way. They all flew into the German lines, so not even the reporters got a break. 3,000 U.S. casualties occurred on D-Day, on that single beach. Well, the Germans did launch a counterattack on the 21st, I'm sorry, the 21st Panzer Division drove a brief wedge between the British and American uh, Canadian beaches, but it was too little and too late. It could not stop. Rommel was right. The other Panzer Divisions were too far, and many of them were severely decimated before they got to the beaches. And anyway, where was Rommel? Well, here is Rommel inspecting. He had gone home to Hurlingen near Ulm. Ulm is the home of a good friend of mine who taught me at DePaul University. It is also the birthplace of Albert Einstein and Count von Zeppelin, who built those big Zeppelin airships. He had gone home for Frau Rommel's June birthday on June 6th. He had even bought her a beautiful pair of shoes from Paris. On June 7th, he was to meet with Hitler at the Eagle's Nest and asked that the 2nd SS Panzer Division that it was in Toulouse and the 9th Panzer Division in Avignon in the south be released to Normandy so he could put them right on the beaches. But most importantly, upon his return, he was going to visit the 352nd Infantry Division that had only recently moved to Omaha Beach, and we didn't know about it. Now, there were three companies in that division infantry companies. The general commanding only had one of those companies at the beach on that morning. The other two were several miles inland in reserve. Rama was going back to tell him either he moved all three companies right up to the beach or he would sack him and put another man in command. So let us say for a moment that Rommel had done that earlier or the general had followed his original orders and all three companies had been at Omaha Beach on that morning that beach would have failed with those additional troops. More bad luck. Those shoes, they didn't fit his wife. So at the end of the first day, there had been over 10,000 Allied sorties by the air. The Germans, 319. Sorry guys. The Longest Day movie shows only those two planes. There were 319 German air attacks, but that wasn't enough. 155 Allied soldiers landed, 72,000 U.S., 83,000 British and Canadian. 2,500 U.S. died, 2,000 other Allied casualties, or other Allied dead, I'm sorry, 12,000 casualties. 
Now, what if the invasion had failed? Well, Eisenhower had prepared this announcement. Our landing in the Shoreburg La Harve area has failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best available information. The troops, the Air and the Navy, did all that bravery and devotion to duty would do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. And now we deal with the big mistake that in the end helped us win Normandy. On June the 7th, Hitler ordered the 15th Army, which is here, to leave Pas de Calais and move down to Normandy. Five divisions, including the 116th Panzer, the strongest armored division in the West. Luckily, the Spanish double agent who was working for the British, his, known, his code name was Greta Garbo. Here he is. On June the 9th, he sent a German to Germany a telegram saying that Normandy was only a feint, that it was a diversionary attack. Von Rundstedt always had believed that. And that a second real division, a real invasion, would hit, sorry, Pas de Calais. So on June 10th, Hitler stopped the deployment and the 15th Army sat there for the next eight weeks until it was too late and the Allies achieved the final breakthrough. Now for the Battle of Normandy. Now look at this map. There's the Normandy beachhead after the first day. Here's where the Allies are in Italy. Here are the Russians. This is all the rest of occupied Europe, all of it. That's June 7th. Hitler asked von Rundstedt what should they do? And von Rundstedt said to him, surrender you fool. <laughs> and he sacked him and replaced him by von Klug, another distinguished German general from the Eastern Front. At the same time, shortly thereafter, on the 17th of July, Rommel was in a staff car. He ran front, the command from the front, and he was out there. And a British Spitfire strafed his car, he was seriously wounded, ended up in a German hospital. Shortly after that, of course, was the botched attempt to blow Hitler up. At his command, the Wolf Slayer in East Prussia, and uh, Rommel was named as knowing about it, and later on they would offer Rommel a choice. Either take poison, or they, he, was, he could stand trial while his wife and his son would end up in a concentration camp. He took poison. Now we start really a battle of attrition that the war, the Germans could not win. Not a single man will leave his position, signed Adolf Hitler. The German divisions came, but they did not mass for their traditional counterattack. They dug in. They were used basically as artillery. And it stopped the Allies for quite some time, but it did not drive them into the sea. The real problem the Allies had at that time was the battle of supply. They did not have a port or dockyard facilities. How do you meet the Army's logistical needs? Churchill came up with an idea, the Mulberry, an artificial harbor. This was capable, you see them here in this picture, of landing 12 tons of stores and 2,500 vehicles a day. The mulberries were built by 25,000 Irish workers. 50 to 150,000 Irish people served in the British Armed Forces, some from Northern Ireland and some from the Republic in the South. 120,000 to 300,000 Irish civilians worked in Britain during the war. Now on D-Day plus 10, 557,000 soldiers had landed. But on the 13th day of, after D-Day, a major storm wrecked the mulberries. Mulberry A was destroyed, Mulberry B far less damaged. It almost shut down the invasion. It almost did what the Germans could not do. Luckily, by D-Day 24, they had repaired it, and 570,000 tons of supplies were landed. However, the Germans did a very effective job in occupying 
most of the major ports of France to the end of the war or blowing them up so they were useless when we, we took them. As you can see from this map though, from June the 7th to July the 25th, here's the beginning, you see these, these lines. It took all the way till July the 25th to break out of Normandy. What went wrong? Well, first, this is not a bush. This is a hedgerow. The, the farmers of France did not have fences and stone walls. They built these hedges to keep their cows in their farms. These were impenetrable walls. And the Allies, the Americans in particular, had a very hard time. At the same time, Montgomery stalled before Caen. Now, Montgomery was a great general. He won Al Alamein. He massed tremendous superiority in airplanes, tanks, and troops before he attacked. And then he allowed Rommel to escape. In this case, he landed. He almost took Caen, not quite. And then it took him all the way to the end of July to take Caen, which was his objective. Now, there were problems. The British were out of manpower. They had no more troops. There were no replacements. In fact, by February of 1945, we didn't have any replacements. We all, you know, we were fighting two wars, one in the Pacific and one in, in Europe. The troops were tired out. Many of these men had been with him in North Africa and in Italy, and now they were there in Normandy. These men were tired. And then, May I say there was lack of push from the top because Montgomery was in charge of the land campaign, wasn't he? Not, not Bradley. So they attacked and they attacked and they attacked and it took them a long time. And the Germans were tremendous defenders. Let's not underrate what the Germans did. But the Germans did not have their best troops in Normandy and they were tired as well. So here is the answer finally. Operation Goodwood that Montgomery launched toward the end of July that took Khan. The Germans did counterattack and slowed the advance down. And then Operation Cobra. And Operation Cobra was a plan to punch, and this is Bradley, you see him in the middle with his generals, to punch a big hole right in the middle of the German line. And that's exactly what they did. Again, they took the bombers away from Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force and they used them to pulverize the German line. 1,800 heavy bombers dropped 5,000 tons of bombs. Unfortunately, they dropped some right on our troops. That's why these guys are looking. But they only, the Americans faced seven seriously weakened enemy divisions and two of them were armored. One was the old Panzer Lehr Division, just 2,200 men left and 45 vehicles were left. And they were up against 15 full American divisions. The commander, General Beierlein, had received a message from Hitler asking, telling everyone has to hold their position. No one should move. And Beierlein replied to him, quote, out in front everyone is holding out, every single one. My grenadiers, my engineers, my tank crews, they are all holding their ground. Not a single man is leaving his post. They are lying silent in their foxholes, for they are already dead. And the Allies did break through. They broke through there, and they also broke through after that's St. Lo. Those of you that go to uh, Normandy, yes, you can visit St. Lo, but there's nothing left of it. It was totally destroyed. And they activated good old George's Third Army, was finally activated, and he began a breakthrough first into Brittany and then across France. The Germans did finally begin a retreat and they were trapped in the Falaise pocket on August 20, 21st. The destruction of the army was almost assured as a force. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see from this, we pulverized the German units, but I'm afraid once again Montgomery was slow to close his end of the trap and many of those Germans escaped to fight against Montgomery in further operations. 
Well, now here is Patton and Bradley and his dog. You'll see his dog on the bottom there. See, it's right here. There he is. And they are discussing Patton's lightning advance. First, across Brittany, but you see those ports. The Germans did not surrender those ports. And Schorberg, even though we caught it, or we captured it, was destroyed. It took months before we could use it. And then he took off across France to the German border. Uh, August 15th, at the same time, Dragoon occurred. This was the invasion of southern France. So you can see here's Montgomery advancing, and you can see Patton's ad advance to the German border and the advance from the south. The Allied armies were diverted to liberate Paris. Originally, we weren't going to do this, and we did. And of course, Hitler appointed a German general that was loyal to him because he placed dynamite and explosives over all of the monuments of France, all the bridges, the Louvre, the Gilles de Palme, the Arts of Triomphe, all the sites that you have seen when many of you have been to Paris, he wanted Paris leveled to the ground. This general refused, he surrendered. And Hitler kept screaming, is Paris burning, is Paris burning? Maybe you saw that awful movie they made, is Paris burning? No, it, never, it did not burn, it surrendered. General Leclerc, the head of a French armored division, was the first into the city, followed by other Allied troops. Here is a picture of that dark day on June the 14th, 1940, when the Wehrmacht goose-stepped down the Champs-Élysées. And now here is the most important picture, maybe, that I think French people, whenever we go to France, many French people always remind us of what we've done to help them, as I remind them what they did to help us in our American Revolution, because we wouldn't have won without French help. Here is the American, on August 25th, the 28th Division of uh, Patton's Third Army marches down the Champs-Élysées, and you think those guys have it made, and they marched right out of Paris and continued the offensive. They didn't stay in Paris, not a one of them. And there's George. Well, George's Third Army, he, he gave one order, seek out the enemy, trap him and destroy him. The Germans never knew what to expect from Patton, and in his operations they were very different from British and other American generals. He tore open the German lines of defense, he trapped thousands of soldiers, and most of them were either killed or they surrendered. The history of the Third Army is one of constant attack. They drove on in fair weather, bad weather, across terrain, across ice, snow, and mud. They coordinated this, armor, infantry, and air power. This was the American Blitzkrieg. The speed of the Third Army forced the Germans into a very haphazard, disastrous retreat. The Third Army gave Germans no time to occupy any defensive strong points. It just kept punching and punching its way forward. And you can see that here in this. The only problem they had was this supply. They had to finally rig up the Red Ball Express because the only way you could get supplies in were still in those mulberries. I want you to think about that. If the Allied supplies were still coming from that mulberry dock, the Germans either had destroyed the other harbors or they occupied it. And Eisenhower was pursuing a policy of a united advanced front. Remember, Eisenhower was there to keep the alliance together. That was his primary role as the commander-in-chief, a united front, so the American British armies would advance in unison. This is similar to the pro the, what the Germans did in 1940, when Guderian punched a hole at Sudan and raced to the English Channel. Hitler was deathly afraid that those panzer divisions had become isolated and cut off. So Guderian said, all right, we'll do it, reconnaissance and force. Rommel was in charge of that tip. He got to the English Channel. It was the greatest victory that Germany ever had. In three weeks, they did what they could not do in four years in World War I. Eisenhower also was afraid of the same thing. Montgomery had failed to keep up in the north 
with Patton in the South. He had been ordered by Eisenhower to take the port of Antwerp, and he didn't. It took until September the 4th for him to do this. And then he was ordered to take the islands. Here they are. Because without these islands, the port was useless, and the Germans had heavily occupied and fortified those islands. He was ordered to take them immediately. He did not take them for 60 days. And as a result, there was a tremendous crisis of supply. And of course, there was tremendous rivalry between Montgomery and Patton, as I think many of you know. And Montgomery proposed an operation he called Market Garden by mid-September to have this solid front. And this was a massive attempt through a very narrow line of advance, even narrower than Patton's, to use, to use thousands, the largest paratroop operation of the war, across, to seize a number of bridges across the Netherlands up to the German border. And it worked, except the last bridge at, Rama, at Annam was too far, and the paratroopers landed on an SS Panzer division that was recuperating, that no one knew, seemed to know about. As a result, the offensive failed. Now here is Patton, Eisenhower, and Bradley discussing the resulting crisis. Because you see now, Patton was at Metz on the German border. There were no organized German forces in front of Patton's army. He was about to flank the Siegfried Line, the West Wall, which was a heavily fortified zone that the Germans had stripped to build Fortress Europa, and now they had begun building up again to defend Germany. Market Garden stopped Patton's advance, so he did not continue to press hard against because there was not enough fuel and supplies. At the same time, so little happened because Market Garden had failed along that whole front for the next three months. The Germans were able to reorganize their armies and mount a stop defense from Holland to Switzerland and also mount the Battle of the Bulge. The consequence of this strategic failure meant that for seven long months, the Canadian, British, American, and French troops tried to break through the West Wall at four different points. It finally swamped under their sure weight. It prolonged the war by six months. The Allied dead, because of this, was higher than the U.S. combined casualties in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. The strategic argument can be made that if Patton had been allowed to continue his advance in September of 1944, he would have flanked the southern end of the Siegfried Line and caused further chaos in Germany, delaying or even eliminating the Nazi Ardennes Battle of the Bulge offensive. If instead Montgomery had been forced by Eisenhower to secure the port of Antwerp in a more judicious way, the Allied supply model would also have been relieved. The war in Europe might have ended not in May of 1945, but in January of 1945. David Ramsey, uh, Admiral Ramsey's son and I are writing a book that we hope to publish for the 75th anniversary of D-Day called Friendly Fire, the other battles of Normandy that will make this case because we feel it's an important case to be made. It certainly does not diminish the importance of Eisenhower or of Bradley, but it does say that potentially other commanders might have done better. Patton, potentially, as a ground commander, at least to the Americans, and even perhaps uh, General Marshall or even Allenbrook would have pushed Montgomery harder. The final result of the Normandy campaign, this is the German cemetery. The Germans had over 450,000 casualties. Here we are. And for the Americans, US, UK, and Canadians. The Normandy invasion was the greatest amphibious assault in history, 
and Sir Bertram Ramsay on the right in this picture emerged as Britain's foremost amphibious warfare commander. He tragically died in an accidental plane crash near Paris on January 2nd, 1945. So significant evidence now exists that serious strategic and tactical errors were made at the highest levels of the Allied command, mainly for political reasons. And politics are important during wars as well, admittedly. It appears that at least several important opportunities were missed to shorten the Second World War in Europe. This in no way diminishes the heroism and sacrifices made by the Allied soldiers, sailors, and airmen that, control, that contributed to this final victory. The Normandy campaign was a major Allied victory. These factors helped to ensure the final defeat of Hitler's Germany and established the United States as a world superpower for the next 60 years. I highly recommend you visit the D-Day Museum in New Orleans and that you tour the Normandy battlefield site in France. I close with Eisenhower's tribute to the fallen soldiers that appears on the wall at Omaha Beach, the American Cemetery. It reads, the American soldiers who are forever near the beachhead they won and in the land they helped to free will never be forgotten. Their memory will always help strengthen the bond of friendship between our countries, heroic alliance for the cause of human freedom. Thank you very much. And if we can turn the lights up now, we can take a few, I'm sorry I went a little over, I apologize, but I hope some of you can stay and can answer a few questions. Now we do have a lady sitting here, if she would stand up in the front, please, and her father was in the French resistance that helped the Allies in 1944 make Normandy a success. So we thank you and the French people. Speak, why don't you speak in the microphone? Go ahead. You don't. It wasn't just in 1944. He was in the resistance from 1940 to 1944. Which he is a good up. example of what I was talking yes. about. Yes. And unfortunately, he was um, tattled on, if you will. And, or what he, was, he was murdered by the Germans. Yeah, but I mean, he was uh, a Frenchman gave yes. his name and his mission, where exactly he was going to be on the 26th of June, 1944. And the Germans got him. They tortured him for the names that he might give up, and they killed him. He was 35 years old. Oh, yes. But I'm glad to hear you say that the French resistance and the fr some, many of the French did yes. what they could and more to, and that's un he, he, at least he was alive for the 6th of June, 1944. Amen. And, and I was nine years old. Yes, very good. All right. Ed, it's my understanding that uh, Winston Churchill argued for an invasion of Europe through the underbelly of Europe so that he could cut off the uh, pot uh, potential Russian advance uh, that was coming from the east. And uh, uh, Eisenhower uh, objected because he wanted to have 100,000 hospital beds uh, in England so that uh, he could service the uh, wounded and the uh, people who were fighting. Can you comment on the decision to invade uh, Normandy versus the underbelly of Europe? Okay. Well, the, the, the key here is we did invade the underbelly of Europe, but we invaded Italy, not Yugoslavia. Uh, it's true. Churchill was deathly afraid that the Red Army, as it rolled through Eastern Europe, would set up puppet governments and would deprive the Romanians, the Poles, the Czechs, and the others of freedom, and that's exactly what happened. In fact, at the end of the war, uh, they even tried, the Russians even tried to occupy Denmark, and Montgomery stopped them at, in early May. He, he put the British Army blocking them, and the British occupied Denmark. And of course, the British sent troops into Greece to, war to fight with the Greek uh, soldiers when the Germans left to stop a potential communist takeover of Greece, not from the Red Army, but from Greek communist guerrillas. There had been a civil war going on in Greece even before the Germans and the Italians invaded. 
So instead of invading, and the reason they did not invade Yugoslavia is very simple. How are you going to supply it? There, there were no supply beaches. And it took them until the end of the war to completely occupy all of Italy. And they only had so many of these landing craft, these Higgins boats. There was a shortage of these boats throughout the war because they were needed in the Pacific, they were needed in the Mediterranean, they were needed for overlord. Next. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the, uh, speaking of the French resistance, on their role in the successful retreat from Dunkirk? I, I, in the on, on the French resistance, on the successful retreat from Dunkirk? Their retreat from Dunkirk. Well, of course, the uh, Dunkirk was the French army, there was no resistance at Dunkirk. There were French troops at Dunkirk that were evacuated to England, and almost all of them immediately were returned to France. Not all, but most of them were returned and ended up uh, in German slave labor camps. When the, the French army surrendered in 1940, what occurred was disgusting, because Patin signed this armistice, and of course, most people felt that Britain would also sign an armistice, all right? And uh, Britain didn't, which is another long story which I'm not going to go into. That's when the resistance started. But the French army was then marched into captivity into Germany. A few were returned, but most were kept prisoners in Germany in slave labor in German factories for the duration of the war. And the resistance gradually started particularly after the invasion of Russia, much larger numbers of French joined it because then uh, the French who were supporting the Russians now began supporting the resistance. But the French had their resistance movement internally. Then there was the Free French. Then there were the Americans had their, and then the British. So we had four different groups there was no unified resistance which was, or, or sabotage attempt. There were four really different groups uh, which got in each other's way, which is another story. If you're interested in this, I'm going to give a program at the Air Museum on it. Next year here, I'm going to do three programs. First is going to be on the Monument Men, the greatest art theft in the history of civilization. The second, the story of the California missions and exactly what happened, wh why they were part of the Spanish colonial effort in the New World, what happened here they had done in other parts of New Spain. And the third is Valley of the Sun, a history of the Coachella Valley. So I will do those three. We haven't scheduled them yet, but I will do those three next year here at the, this museum. But other questions, maybe we can take one more question and then I will also uh, stay to answer questions. Just come up to the microphone, if you would. What you just described about D-Day is incredible. Thank you. I don't see how we did this. And then I realized we were also fighting Japan. Correct. How in the world is this possible? Well, it's called total war. You know, as I said, by February of 1945, there were no additional troops to be sent to the Pacific or to Europe. So when we won the war in May in Europe, those troops were not going to go home. Most of them were going to go to the Pacific, all right? And uh, they weren't happy about that, okay? And of course, the troops in the Pacific were still fighting the Japanese, uh, which is another story. Yes? I was just wondering the impact of breaking the code Breaking the code. Breaking the code and its impact All right. either on either war. All right. The, the Enigma code machine was a device that the Germans invented before the war. There was a second code machine separate for submarines and another one for the military. And the Germans thought it was unbreakable. We broke the code at Benchley Park, the Allies, and the variations of it. Maybe you've seen the movie about Benchley Park, which was very good. The first real computers were developed to do this. It was important, it was important, but not all of the German intelligence was sent uh, by radio or through code. Some of it was sent verbally 
And there, that's how we missed that, that huge infantry division appearing in Normandy. We didn't know anything about that. And many times, of course, it took time for the code to be broken and for, the, and for it to be analyzed and then to be acted on so that it was not an instantaneous process. It did help shorten the war, there's no doubt about it. And we also broke the Japanese codes. But it was not decisive in and, and unto itself. It did not, it was not going to end the war, all right? So thank you very much, you've been a great audience. See you next year, thank you, thank you.